Welcome to those of you who have joined us. We have uh, almost half of you here at this point. Thanks for being here early. Uh, we will get started in about a minute. Just wanted to run some audio so you have a chance to adjust your speakers. But one last chance to grab a beverage or use the restroom real quick. We'll get started here in about one minute. Welcome to those of you who have joined us. It is the top of the hour. I'm gonna give us another minute or so, just to allow a few more people in before we get started. But thanks for being here on time. Appreciate you guys being here this morning. Okay, I think it's okay to get started. Welcome back, everybody. My name is Jeff Simmons. Again, I am your Director of Supervision and Instruction, and I get to kick off the second day of Summer Conference today. Glad everybody's here today. I hope you had a really good day of learning yesterday. I know I had an opportunity to obviously not just participate in the two keynotes yesterday, but I also i have been through about three of the breakouts in the course and there's just some some great content in there some things that have definitely encouraged me to rethink some of my habits and um, just some of the things that i'd like to do to improve and grow myself so i hope you're finding some of those things as well as you go through the content just a few reminders i just want to refocus here real quick as we get started today and um just give you an opportunity to rethink through what you learned yesterday that was most impactful whether it was shared uh, from Stacy or Sydney, or whether it was something you learned in one of the breakout sessions, what was most impactful to you yesterday as you went through your learning? Consider those things that you might want to apply to either your own professional growth or your personal growth. I said yesterday at the beginning of the day that you know our intent here is to make sure that you're focusing on yourself as a person and as a professional because those two get tied together. And uh, I believe it was, um, I forget if it was Stacy or Sydney, but they said you can't pour from an empty cup, right? Like we have to, we have to be full. So I hope you're finding something that helps you refill and um, get ready for, for the next year that we have ahead of us here and consider some things that you want to track as a, a professional or personal goal. We do have the note catcher available in the course to help you do that. You're going to want to refer back to that before the end of the keynote today. Um, our presenter today is going to touch on some things about setting goals that will help you kind of think of, of how to craft those in a way that they're um, achievable and ways that you can um, make sure that you've hit that target. A couple of housekeeping items. We do have uh, an assessment for you. That will be kind of your, your way of showing that you participated in summer conference this year. That will be available within the Schoology course after three o'clock mountain time today. So two o'clock Pacific time, that will magically appear in the resource course. And you'll want to make sure that you complete that before the end of the day next Friday, June 26th. That's when everything is due. 
Um, also, uh, an, uh, a reminder from our HR operations team, if you haven't already, we need you to return your acknowledgement letter. That is where you indicate that you are uh, willing to be an IDLA teacher again next year and you abide by our handbook and rubric and expectations and all of those things. It's a pretty simple um, piece to return, but it's something that we will need in order for you to continue um, teaching for us. So make sure that you submit that. And then just one update on using Zoom, and I ran into this yesterday as well. If you are trying to chat within Zoom, note who you are sending your chat to. So for example, if it says you're sending that to panelists, you're only going to send it to those of us who you can see our picture or our video. If you select panelists and all attendees, it will go to everybody. So say, for example, you're trying to send people a link to a video and you only send it to the panelists and nobody else can see it. So you'll want to, to check that and just make sure that you're sending messages to the appropriate groups of people. Just a, a little nuance with Zoom here that caught a few of us yesterday. There was a lot of great um, things that were shared in the chat yesterday, but not everybody got a chance to see those. So, so double check that before you chat. Okay, I think that is it for the updates. So let's get started with today's content. And we're actually going to start with our best practice in teaching awards today. We always give awards every year to a teacher in every department who has just been outstanding. And we we solicit nominations for teaching awards from both our principals and our site coordinators. And you're gonna see um, a, a mix of those today when we show you who has won awards. In full disclosure, nobody who won an award knows that they have won an award. So hopefully this comes as a nice surprise. If you do receive an award, your award is in the mail. It will be coming to you that way. We have an actual award for you. Um, we'd love for you to maybe take a picture and send it back to us or have, give us something that we can share through our social media, but we wanna take a chance to still celebrate you. So I was trying to think of a way to quantify, you know, why do we, why do we give out awards? And I came across this, this quote from Booker T. Washington. It says, excellence is to do a common thing in an uncommon way. And my first thought was, well, well doesn't this just describe all teachers in general? Like, don't we all find ways to do something common in a very uncommon way. All of us have chances to teach people or chances to learn in our lives, but teachers have a way of making that such a magical thing, right? Um, but then we have our, our really excellent teachers that we want to identify. So if teaching is a common thing, then I think our award winners today are those who are doing that in an uncommon way. So let's get started. So first up we have our 2020 Best Practices in Teaching Award winner for the electives content area. And that goes to Danielle Barzi. So Danielle was nominated by her IDLA principal, Jared Jenks. And Jared said that Danielle is an outstanding teacher. She is committed to our students. She exceeds the expectations of the rubric in most areas. She does a great job of communicating with each student through her feedback on assignments. She provides written and multimedia feedback on multiple assignments in each unit. She also communicates with site coordinators and parents effectively and is proactive. She's able to foresee possible misunderstandings the students may have on assignments and provides updates that foreshadow new content and learning. Mrs. Barzi is an exemplary teacher that strives to meet the individual needs of each of her students. Her dedication and commitment to teaching is an example for all to follow. Please, please take a chance to uh, join me in thanking Danielle for her hard work in the chat and congratulations, Danielle. Okay, next we have our best practices in teaching award for English. And this year that's going to go to Melinda Hatton. So Melinda was nominated by two site coordinators we have Camden Rovig, who said, Melinda is amazing to work with, so quick to reply. She trusts my judgment, so she, since she cannot be physically in the classroom, I'd be happy to work with her again. And then Dan Bolingbroke, another of our site coordinators, said, Lindy is a superior online teacher. She doesn't just assume that the course curriculum teaches everything. She uses each update, office hour, or feedback as a teaching moment. If students truly watch and listen to our videos, they are inspired to improve in all subjects. Thank you, Lindy, for everything that we do, for everything that you do uh, for us all year long. We really, really appreciate you. All right, moving along, we have 
our foreign language best practices in teaching award winner. And this year that's Charlotte Dolacek. So Charlotte was nominated by her IDLA principal, LT Erickson. Charlotte does an outstanding job of giving detailed and individualized feedback in the gradebook. On at least two assignments in each unit, usually more, she gives video or audio feedback to each student. The feedback is specific to each student's work and needs. Additionally, she has phone conversations with each student at least once during each unit of the course. She spends an amazing amount of time giving high quality and individualized feedback to each student. I have worked with many teachers over the past five years as a principal, but nobody rivals her frequent, specific, and individualized feedback. That's awesome. Thank you, Charlotte, for your commitment to each individual student in your course. Okay, health and PE. Our award winner for health and PE this year is Megan Milliken. Megan was nominated by uh, site coordinator Kimberly Hockendoner. Kimberly said that she is on top of her class and her students. Megan has gone out of her way to help a senior at our school who has a learning disability as well as a language barrier get through the Health Flex class. She has consistently written detailed emails to him, copies me on each one with clarifying information. She has called him, called me, and his special education teacher plus modified assignments so that he can pass this graduation requirement by May 8th. It is wonderful to work with a teacher who is knowledgeable and flexible in our new paradigm of teaching and learning online and under strict stay at home orders in our county during this pandemic. Shout out to Megan. Thank you, Megan, so much for your hard work with this student and with all of your students. Shout out to our flex teachers as well. Megan's one of our Longtime flex teachers, we appreciate everything that you guys do. Okay, next up is our math best practices and teaching award winner. And this year that is Misha Beck, another flex teacher. So Misha was nominated by uh, her IDLA principal, Monty Wolstenhume. Misha is one that goes above what is expected for her students. In her Algebra 2 Flex courses, a tough subject for many students, she creates teacher tips that are insightful, clear and concise, and structured to guide students with their learning. Her follow-up communication with students and parents is positive and direct. She is a great IDLA teacher. I agree. Thank you, Misha, so much. We appreciate you. Moving on to science. Our best practices and teaching award winner for science this year is Carissa Zollinger. So Carissa was nominated both by a site coordinator and by her IDLA principal. So Angela Morrow, one of our site coordinators said, this teacher creates helpful videos every unit, uses excellent feedback strategies and replies to emails quickly and thoroughly. Her encouraging words make students want to achieve the best grades possible. And then Terry Sorensen, our principal, added that she is pleased to nominate Carissa to be recognized for IDLA best practices in teaching. Carissa creates exemplary updates for her, for her courses. Her updates are visually engaging, keep students on track with housekeeping items, and provide excellent support for course content. She uses a variety of technologies to record herself giving class presentations on course materials and to provide videos and other information to meet the needs of students throughout the course. Her posts to the discussion board build relationships with students, extend conversations, and add encouraging student interaction with her posts. When I view Chris's gradebook, I am blinded by blue comment boxes. I never have to search for an assignment that has feedback provided for all students because they are numerous. Her feedback is always individualized, positive, and constructive. Carissa uses multimedia feedback on numerous assignments as well and emails me frequently to let me know which assignments will have audio feedback. One of Carissa's greatest strengths is her ability to reflect on her teaching. This year, she felt her IPLP goal may need revising for second semester. She had worked on her goal and could have easily let it go, but she reached out to me about revising her goal to better meet her individual teaching needs. Carissa is a master online teacher, and I'm grateful for the chance I had to work with her this year. That is awesome. Thank you so much, Carissa. Okay, social studies. This year's best practices in teaching award winner for social studies is Dennis Amendi. Dennis was nominated by his principal, Kelsey Williams. 
Kelsey said that Dennis is being nominated because he continually goes out of his way to support his students. Dennis strives to develop a relationship with each one so he can support them at their place of learning. He is not only flexible, but also creative in allowing students ways to demonstrate their content mastery. Dennis is a proficient communicator. He interacts with his students in ways they find engaging and helpful. Dennis does not wait for students to come to him with questions. He seeks out those who are struggling to offer additional supports. Dennis responds almost immediately to all communication and his students know he is present and available. Dennis deserves recognition for the countless hours it takes to do what he does. Thank you so much, Dennis. Since these awards are a surprise, I went into your Schoology courses to pull your picture off of your profile to use for my slides. So um, apologies if, uh, if that's not the best picture of Dennis there. I do know that Dennis likes riding motorcycles. So I think that's Dennis in his element there. Thank you, Dennis, so much. Okay, we have a computer science best practices and teaching award winner. So this is uh, selected from those teachers who teach our computer science courses. And this year's winner is Lindsay Hutchins. So Lindsay was nominated um, both by her IDLA principal and by a TA that she worked with in a custom section. So uh, the, her TA was Nicole Sherman. And Nicole said that Lindsay has been excellent at communicating with me about student progress and concerns and working together to come up with a solution. She meets with students who are struggling face to face as well. I've enjoyed working with her. Her communication has been the best I have had as an ideal ATA. And then Laurel Nelson added that Lindsay does an excellent job creating just in time videos for her students and adding them to her announcements to guide students through the challenging computer science materials and lessons. She also creates content that she uses in her office hours. She has the art of creating videos that are professional and motivating. Awesome. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you so much. Okay, we have two more. This one is our Innovation Award. So this is an award we added a few years ago, and it is uh, intended to just capture um, any teacher in any content area who is just really doing some innovative things, who is just really helping to push the envelope of online learning in our state and help our model evolve. And we try to recognize that within our faculty every year. So when we looked at the nominations this year, the one that stuck out to us as the Innovation Award is Fabio, Fabio Caminati. Fabio was nominated by his principal, Ron Pernu. Ron said that Fabio has done an excellent job the past couple of years working with custom sessions of five or more classes per semester, in addition to all the classes he is teaching as well. He works long hours, making sure that all students are receiving detailed and constructive feedback on their work. He is positive with his comments and also gives constructive but positive feedback when students need direction on meeting the criteria of the assignments. Fabio has worked well with the cooperative model, which has more than one teacher working in multiple custom sections. He is, only, he is not only responsive and in a timely manner with students, but with others that are involved with every session being taught, such as principals, parents, site coordinators, and other personnel in the face-to-face -face school. It is truly a pleasure to work with Fabio. I just wanna add that Fabio has been one of the teachers that's really worked with us to develop our own co-teaching model where we have two teachers working together with a larger number of students. He's put together some professional development for us that we've been able to use to help teachers working in that role. He's consistently provided us some good feedback on that. Fabio, thank you. Um, this is just a small token of, of our appreciation for the work that you've done to help us evolve that model. So thank you so much. Okay. We added a new award this year. And this is our Rookie of the Year Award. So we wanted to also recognize the excellence in our first year teachers, because we know um, that we have the opportunity to hire some of the best teachers in the state. And even our first year teachers really bring a lot to the table. And uh, we wanted to recognize a teacher who was nominated twice this year as our first ever Rookie of the Year. And that is Dr. Allison Touchstone. So Allison was nominated both by a site coordinator, Sharon Parker, and by her IDLA principal, Bob Hyde. So Sharon said, the Dr. Touchstone is always sending out communications to students with extras, such as dated unit guides to help keep students on task, or extra videos to explain a concept they are struggling with. 
Uh, Bob added that Dr. T goes above and beyond expectations in providing her students detailed feedback, consistent reminders to all stakeholders via email and phone, and constantly in contact with me and the main office when needed, uh, class or curriculum improvements are needed. Dr. T puts countless hours into the course to ensure student success. Dr. T might be the most organized teacher that I have worked with yet. I am also going to add uh, that Allison had her Bitmoji picture as her profile, so I had to go somewhere else to pull this picture, so apologies uh, for the picture, but she does teach vet science, so maybe that's an appropriate picture for a veterinary science teacher, but we are super excited to have uh, Dr. Touchstone and all of our new teachers on our group in our faculty this year. So that is um, the end of our teaching award, so thank you uh, congratulations to all of you who are recognized this year, and thank you to all of you for everything that you do every year. I am going to now transition over to our speaker for the day. So um, yeah, we have joining us today one of our own teachers, Teresa Carter, is going to share with us today. And Teresa is, uh, is very humble and did not send me a bio that I could use to introduce her. So I'm just going to share a few things that I know about Teresa. Um, she submitted a presentation to us when we were looking for content for summer conference that I felt was just really on point with what we want all of you to take away today. So we asked her, I asked her, I maybe twisted her arm a little bit, to share with all of you this morning uh, what, what she had to share in her breakout, because I feel like it really sets the stage for today. Teresa is one of our longtime teachers. She works in regions one and two to support schools. And um, in, in all fairness, we love to tease Teresa to death because uh, she's just so good natured about it. But in, in all seriousness, Teresa is one of the teachers that we have who always inspires me. Everything that she is doing with her students, anything that she shares in a just in time, I always just feel like it's just really encouraging and inspiring to me. So Teresa, thank you for being willing to share with us today. And I am going to turn the time over to you. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> that was humbling, yes. Uh, let me share my screen right quick. So uh, I'm just thrilled to be here. And I, I was really floored by all of the, the messages that I got from people over the last couple of days, emails and texts. And I had to laugh because several of them said, well, one of them said, are you going to eat a cheeseburger, referring to a, a commencement address that I gave a long time ago. But other people said, are you nervous? And I said, no, because I, I'm just sharing my learning, which I love to do. And I'm really passionate about this topic. So um, this, wasn't, this wasn't scary to me, but I had a dream last night. <clears throat> and I dreamt that somebody who had edit access to my slides, went in, and I know who you are. I know the people who have edit access. I dreamt that they went in and changed my slides and put some random red words on there. So I would click on a slide and it would come up with just bizarre words that were in bold red font. And so, yeah, I got up pretty early to make sure that that hadn't happened. But um, I wanna make a special point to welcome uh, our new folks. So if you are new to IDLA, if you are a, a part-time teacher, full-time teacher, uh, transitioning to a different role, to a different team, or uh, coming on as a, a new principal, I just want to extend the warmest welcome to you. I also have a couple of other shout outs. Um, the, the best practice folks, uh, you guys just rock this and uh, it, it, it's exciting to see all the work that you're doing for our students. And, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the person setting up all this room. So woohoo, Lou, way to set up Zoom. Um, I, I want to mention yesterday from yesterday that Cheryl's message and Bob's mess or uh, uh, Randy's message were really inspiring to me. And I know that for our other keynote speakers, that if we had been anywhere near an auditorium, we would have been on our feet for uh, Sydney and Stacy, So I'm standing right now. And since we're not in an auditorium, here's their ovation. So 
So Jeff tells one story I noticed about, about how I got to be here and I have a different story. When we were throwing ideas around for summer conference, the keynote addresses, I suggested an author who wrote a powerful book. And so here's how that conversation turned out. And I just wanna remind Jeff that uh, this is not a case of you get what you paid for, I promise. So before we jump into our topic today, I do wanna get a couple of, of uh, engagement pieces out of the way. So because of the size of our group, we had to change the engagement just a little bit. And I know that you are using the chat, but as things either resonate with you or sit with you wrong, if you could just kind of keep a, a mental reflection and either toss a smiley face in or a frowny face into the chat, I'd appreciate that. And then a few times I ask you a yes or a no question. And in the chat, if you would just put a Y or an N, so we'll practice. In the chat, smiley or frowny. Teresa, while they're doing that, can you stop and restart your screen share? It has some on our end anyway, it's got some little pixelated things in there. Yeah. You might you bet. It. You bet. Thank you. Lots of smiley faces in the chat this morning. I need to get back to my um my incognito window here. Hang on just a second. This is why Lou didn't want me to share my screen because I had too many. There we go. Hang on just a second here. Do -do -do. Okay, is that better? hasn't started yet. Okay. How's that? That's much better. Thank you. Oh, good. No, I appreciate you letting me know that. All right. Did we have engagement in Zoom? I can't see the chat. So. <laughs> Lots of smiley faces in the okay. chat. Okay, awesome. Good work. Now I want to try the poll feature and make just a little bit of fun of Zoom rooms from the past spring. So Jeff will push out a question and the question should say something like, I would only turn on my Zoom camera now if I had time to put on proper attire, I had time to comb my hair, if I weren't on my boat fishing, I can't hear you, I'm teeing off. Lots of responses coming in. Looks like we're about 50% of the way there. I really wanna know how many people are not by their computer. <laughs> the golfing ones may have been pointed at a few people. We'll give the golfers another 10 seconds to respond. Perfect. All right, so we have about 75% of you who are paying attention. Thank you. <laughs> cool. I'll go ahead and end that. And there we go. Oh, time to comb their hair. Okay, I thought for sure it was going to be the, the pajama top or something like that. Okay. I do want to know if Carol Jones put number four on there. <laughs> okay. 40, 40 responses on that. <laughs> I realized as I was prepping for this that I start a lot of presentations with, uh, I read this book, <laughs> so here I am again. The last couple of years, I have studied habits and habit science, hoping to find ways to give my students 
better online learning skills and habits, and a better chance at reaching their goals. It, it seems like, even in my careers class, it seems like we are always asking students and teachers to set goals, but we miss the step of building habits that will lead to those goals. I have a real poll for you now, and there are two questions embedded in this, and it has to do with my next statement. So I'll have Jeff push out the question. So the first question is, did you set a New Year's goal or resolution? And the second question is, are you still pursuing the goal you set? And make sure you respond in the poll. If you put your response in the chat, it won't, won't populate the poll. Did you set a New Year's resolution or a goal? Are you still pursuing the goal? We got 80% already have responded. That's awesome. Give you another 15 seconds or so. Got to give the golfers time to get back to their cart. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to end this and we'll share it out here. Perfect. So here's the reason I asked you that question. Uh, you can go ahead and close that. Here's the reason I asked that question. According to a poll that I read, 80% of us set goals on New Year's Day and 6% of us achieve those goals. And it's not because we're losers or slackers or lazy or bad people. We just don't have the right system in place to ensure successful reaching of goals. I also would like you to consider this from our students' perspective. They might not be lazy. It might not be a, ca a case of them slacking or not caring. Perhaps they've never been given the tools to build systems around their habits and goals. My message today centers around this. We can't achieve goals if we don't first put in place the habits that pave the way for reaching those goals. Learning how to break that habit down into its smallest elements will help us design our environments for big changes in our trajectory, whether it's in our personal lives or our professional lives. So although my first examples are, uh, are from my personal life, be thinking about how you could apply those or transfer that learning to your own professional life as well. I have found personally that when I make those changes on a personal level, it often flows over into my teaching, which of course then impacts my students' lives. So let's talk about the impact of a small change. James Clear, one of the books I read in his book, Atomic Habits, gives this example and our very own Valerie Doherty made this into a graphic for me. So thanks, Valerie. So let's say a plane takes off from Los Angeles and it's bound for New York. If we move the nose of the plane before it takes off, if we move the nose of the plane nine feet to the right, it changes the plane's trajectory so much that will land 240 miles south in Washington, DC. That's a tiny change and a huge impact over time. I'd like us to carry this image and that thought as we work our way through our next ideas. Let's identify why and how our brain builds habits. So, our brain solves problems for efficiency. It's looking for the easiest way to solve the problem, which will make it feel good. Habits let the brain automate the things that it doesn't need to spend energy on. And it wants to save energy for solving the next really big important thing. Think tiger, but not Joe Exotic. The brain doesn't distinguish between a bad habit and a good habit. It's looking 
for ease and efficiency. So as presented with a problem up here in the right or some sort of stimulus, it tries out strategies until something works well and it makes note of that emotional feeling, that little tiny jolt of dopamine that says this. And then it wants to repeat that process, which then of course lays down that path of automaticity in the brain. Underlying every habit, there are four elements, which researchers have named the habit loop. There is a cue or a trigger. There's a craving. The brain remembers, if we think back to our example, the brain remembers how it felt to solve that problem and it anticipates or it craves that good emotional jolt. The brain responds in a way that it did before and then it's rewarded with that emotional satisfaction. If uh, if we think, or most people think that we build our own habits by repeating uh, a, a practice or repeating an action. But in reality, it's our brain that builds the habits and we just repeat those. But what we repeat defines who we are, right? And isn't it cool that we can change that if we want? So in the chat with a Y or an N, answer this question, please. This information is making me think about my current habits. Lots of yeses. I don't even see one no yet. Awesome. So let's talk about what it takes to create a good habit. So to start something brand new. In order to create a good habit, we have to design our environment, or we get to, I should say, design our environment to include these four elements. We can manipulate that path in the brain by clearly knowing the four steps of the habit loop. One thing that I appreciated about James Clear's take on the habit loop is that he added this layer over here. So to cue craving response and reward, he added an extra layer that, that helps us view how those should be used to create a new habit. Thus, the cue needs to be something really obvious to us. The craving has to be something that's really attractive to us. It has to give us that little jolt of dopamine. The response has to be something that's easy and the reward has to be something that's super satisfying to us. So in the example I will show you, the first example, I wanted to show you how I designed my cue to make it obvious, how I made it attractive to satisfy that craving, how I made it easy for myself, and then the fact that I accomplished it is always satisfying to me. So in December, I think it was December, maybe it was January, I participated in an I Dig Fitness Challenge. And one of the tasks was to create a good habit. And also, if you have not joined I Dig Fitness, you should. Anyway, in the challenge, I wanted to build a habit of cleaning my kitchen. With just two people at home, I found myself letting things stack up for, uh, let's just say a certain amount of days. I don't wanna be too vulnerable, you know? And then the task took so long when I finally did tackle that it, it was discouraging. So I used the habit loop and I determined that seeing the first dishes stack up on the counter would be my cue. I'd leave the soap out so that I could get the dishes soaking quickly. I have one of those dishwashers where you have to wash them first to, before you put them in the dishwasher. But that cleaned off the counter and it also broke the process into a manageable chunk of time. So then when I had a few minutes, I'd load the rinsed dishes and I found that having a clean kitchen totally activated that reward center in my brain. I craved that clean kitchen and I made it easy for myself to achieve that. 
And you might be thinking, well, how tough is that? She moved the soap. And that's my point. If we make it easy and we make it doable, then it will stick. Let's move to breaking a bad habit. We just need to do the inverse of the visible, attractive, easy, and satisfying that I just showed you. Here's how I use the inverse law to break a bad habit, or I should say actually that it was to keep myself from sliding back to a bad habit. So now I'm solving for invisible, unattractive, difficult, and satisfying or unsatisfying. I don't eat sugar. I gave up sugar a few years ago and I had a terrible addiction to it. So I'm pretty proud of the fact that I am not beholden to that, uh, that food anymore. But here's the context. My husband likes Jif peanut butter. And although I like peanut butter, if you read the food label, there's sugar. There are two types of sugar in the first three ingredients. So it's bad for me. But because I'm a super nice wife, oh man, I wish he was here right now. We have Jif in our house. And that means that I couldn't design for invisible. I needed to design for those other three elements so that I didn't slip back into this bad habit. My first attempt at making it difficult, that's clear packing tape. That was not realistic because Tom was not super pumped about taking the tape off just to have some peanut butter. So I called that a fail. I suppose this slide could satisfy both difficult and unattractive. If you don't know me, I'm five feet tall. And by placing the GIF on the top shelf, it not only hit that cord of, man, I'm just too lazy to drag the chair over there, but it also made it so that I didn't see the jar. Finally, the part that really hit that emotional cord was the fact that I get sick if I eat sugar. But when I manipulate my environment successfully, it activates that reward center in my brain and I like the feeling that I have more control over my habits. So right now, Jeff is going to share an example of another way of um, changing habits. So Jeff? Yeah, thanks, Teresa. So Teresa and I were talking about this and I was like, oh yeah, it's like temptation bundling, blah, blah, blah. And, and so we decided that maybe we wanted to add this as, a, as an option as well. So I, I love the, the GIF peanut butter example and it, it's just, I love the, the simplicity in it, right? That there's some real simple things that we can do to try to build better habits. So one, one thing that I've tried in my life is uh, something called temptation bundling. So that sounds, it's, it actually has a, like a really bad title, right? Like it's not like you take two bad things and bundle them together. But what you do is you link a habit that you want to do with a habit that you need to do. So my example is that uh, a few years back, uh, oh, go ahead and stay on that slide there for a second. Oh, sorry. A few years back, um, my wife and I bought a, a trainer for a bike. So you could basically um, put your, your mountain bike or your whatever bike you rode into, in your house and you would set it up and it had a wheel that the back, uh, the back tire would, would, would run against. And so you could essentially just make your mountain bike like a stationary bike. And so we set this up because it was winter. You're not as able to get outside and be as active in the winter. It's dark by the time you get off work anyway. And so we felt like that would be a way to stay active. And of course, like everybody else on the planet, you set up something like that and two days later, uh, you don't use it anymore. So what, what I decided to do was that the room that that was set up in, I had a smart TV and uh, one of the new Star Wars movies had just come out on Netflix. I believe it was Rogue One. I understand that the picture I have here is not of Rogue One. Apologies to the Star Wars purists, but uh, that's the one I could get for free. So, um, so what I did was I decided that I was really excited about watching Rogue One on Netflix, um, but I was only going to watch it if I was riding the bike. So that way I would have to ride the bike if I wanted to watch the movie. So if we go to the next slide, that's an example of temptation bundling. So I took something that I enjoy doing with something that I need to do. 
So what are some other ways I could do temptation bundling in my life? So things that I enjoy doing, I, I enjoy watching Netflix. I do like to read. I like watching, walking my dog. I like playing the drums. What are the things in my life that I tend to procrastinate? Uh, helping with the laundry, not my favorite thing to do. Um, cleaning up my desk, that's something that I could definitely do more often. Making a difficult, difficult phone call, that's always something that's easy to put off. And you know, helping with the dishes, really not my favorite either, right? So those are things that, that I need to do. So how could I bundle those things together? So if we look at the next slide, Here's some ways that maybe I could use temptation bundling to, to solve that problem. So maybe I fold and put away the laundry while watching my favorite Netflix movie or show. Um, I could make the difficult phone call while walking my dog, or I could do the dishes while I listen to an audio book that I really enjoy, or I play the drums, but only after cleaning my desk. So those are ways that, that, uh, that's a method that I've tried as well is sometimes if I know there's something that I need to do, I tie it to something that I, that I want to do. And then between the two, um, I, I know that I'm going to get both of those things done. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. And I do want to mention that all of the books that I reference in my work cited have just some really phenomenal strategies, but I kind of wanted to focus more on the habit science piece and how we can change our brains so that we have more control over our habits and our actions. But if you want interesting reading, I recommend all of those. So at this point, I want to reiterate that I started out being curious about and changing my personal habits. But as with anything that I read, I always look for ways to apply that to my own teaching. I think probably all of us do that. And I keep asking, how can we teach our students about developing the habits that make them more successful. So I spent the last year, I think it was about a year, proving to myself that it was possible to teach my online students habit strategies. And I do talk about some of those in my breakout session habits before goals. In all the examples that you've heard, oops, I skipped one. In all the examples that you heard, the most important element in making the habit stick is that the brain needs a win. It needs the habit to satisfy that craving so it feels successful and confident when that's accomplished. So when Jeff bundles those two tasks together, it makes him feel successful and he's more likely to sustain that habit. You have complete power to design your personal and professional environments for positive change. But before we pivot to building habits in our professional lives, I came across two random things and I wanted to include them and they didn't really fit anywhere else. So they're here. I wanna make this point about advertising. I think it's worth mentioning how marketing companies are totally dialed into habit science in order to make money. The story, and I think it was in um, Charles Duhigg's book, but the story of how toothpaste got to be foamy is long and involved, way more so than you'd ever imagine. But here's the crux. There is absolutely nothing in the foaming part of toothpaste or shampoo that makes our teeth or hair cleaner. What happened was in all of their testing, they found that that foaming activated the craving part of the habit loop people anticipated or craved that clean feeling. And Procter & Gamble sold a lot more toothpaste and shampoo once they made it part of, or uh, made that foam. Also, if you're curious, I came across this other example. And if you're curious about the sales, uh, the amount of sales that Febreze had before they switched to a marketing strategy that played on the craving part of the habit loop, just Google Febreze marketing story, but don't do it now. I saw you reach for your keyboard. Thank, just think about this for a moment though. If the advertising world has fine tuned this, why aren't we designing more for this in education? What can we do to make kids crave learning and anticipate a reward? And I don't mean the reward of a grade. I mean the reward of a, an accomplishment. Well, 
we can help them build habits that make them successful and then that builds student agency. They have more ownership in their learning. My second random item was the impact of habit development on wellness. And because I teach health, this was really fascinating to me. But the studies have found that people who understand the habit loop and, and they and intentionally design their environments for good habits have a much easier time with life's curveballs and navigating big crises, such as, oh, let's just throw out a pandemic. But good habit development led to higher skills in managing stress and implementing healthy changes. And I wanna point out that this isn't about willpower or having willpower fail. This is about changing that habit loop in your brain. So uh, a quick why or N in the chat, if you would, have you picked up at least one tidbit of new information so far? Y or N? Lots and lots of yeses. You know, and I'm thinking, Jeff, that um, I didn't have a backup plan if a whole bunch of people put no. So I would just say, well, Jeff, that wraps it up and we'll just go back to you. <laughs> Oh, you have a couple of no's. I didn't have a plan of no if everybody was putting no's in there, just so that you know that. You have a couple of no's, but most All right. of yeses. Pretty high, pretty high number of yeses here. Okay, good. If you put an N in there, please reach out to me on my contact information at the end slide, and I would be happy to have further conversations. This stuff fascinates me. So okay. Uh as we transition from thinking about that personal growth to professional growth, I would offer this. The way to change the trajectory in either realm is to change our habits. So IDLA offers this amazing culture, I believe it's amazing, where it's safe to learn and hone our craft as educators. One of the many ways that we get to grow as teachers is to set goals in our Individualized Professional Learning Plan, or the infamous IPLP, as you may have heard it called. If the IPLP ever feels like a hoop to you, though, I invite you to look at it from this perspective. What habits can I put in place to ensure that I set and reach meaningful goals? Be thinking about this habits and goals question because we have time carved out this afternoon for teachers to meet with principals specifically about setting goals in our IPLP. Okay, uh, all of our professional learning this past year or all of our professional teaching practices are aligned to the national standards for quality online teaching called the NSQ. And for our returning teachers, if you'll remember, this document is what drove all of our just in times this year, as we took a deep look at what quality online instruction looks like. In standard A, the professional responsibilities, they use language such as be a reflective practitioner, find opportunities for growth, seek learning opportunities, and set and evaluate goals. But once you pick your goal, please, please take some time to reflect on what habits you'll need in place to truly meet that goal in a meaningful way. Otherwise, you're right, it is a hoop and we haven't met our standard for quality. I love this image from Catlin Tucker's new book uh, called Balance with Blended. She uses this with her students to set their learning goals. And by the way, the NSQ standard D2 says that we should help our learners set goals and conference with them about their progress. So this template is a good tool that we can not only use for setting our own goals, but helping our students set theirs. In, I think it's in both the sessions on, the breakout sessions on custom sessions and then in my habits, I talk about how I specifically teach my students about habits 
and then follow up with them as they set their goals and make that a conversation piece throughout the year. In this slide, I've given you a quick example of how I would fill out this form to transfer to my IPLP, just to highlight that the habits part here in the middle pane uh, so here would be the goal, and then how will I get there? These are the habits that you would need to identify, and you can break those down into very tiny elements if you need to, but remember that you're looking for success and the ease of meeting that goal. That way it will stick. Here's another strategy that might help us. In his book, um, The Culture Code, Daniel Coyle mentions this strategy called mental contrasting. Let's take a moment to walk through the first three steps of this exercise in your mind and at least ponder this habits piece. That's the part that I designed into that. So imagine a goal that you want to meet, and this can be personal or professional, but just right now in your mind, imagine a goal that you would like to meet. And now imagine how it would feel and how it would look to meet that goal. Be real specific in your, in your mind, real vivid about what that would feel and what that would look like to meet that goal. And now picture the barriers that stand between meeting that goal and imagining it, right? What are the barriers? What's standing in your way? And then I would just add, oh, sorry about that. I would just add that once you pick those barriers, that's where you can design habits. You can look at that, that cue, craving, response, and reward and solve for the barriers. A quick take action recap. Eventually you will choose a habit, whether it's an, a new habit or you wanna break an old habit. You'll think about the four steps of the habit loop, the cue, craving, response, and reward, and you can sketch it all out. But remember that to make it stick, it has to satisfy that little craving. You have to identify what will make that really easy and really attractive for you to get that little jolt. Give your brain that win. Design for a small enough level that you feel a win. One of the authors mentioned uh, he was trying to build a habit of flossing his teeth and he started out just flossing one tooth. That always sticks in my mind. If I think about a goal, anybody can floss one tooth. If you're not reaching your goals, then go back to the habits. Go back to step two and really be clear about the cue, craving, response, and reward and apply those strategies. One reason that to me that it's important to build good habits lies in our NSQ document. Out of curiosity, I searched the document and the word models is used 14 times as a verb. To me, that says that it, they expect us to model good learning habits and practices for our students. One of the most gratifying elements in my own learning about habits in the last couple of years is the sense of agency and the sense of confidence it's given me. In general, people who master their habits are high performers who have greater control over the trajectory of their career and their health. And finally, in, especially in times of uncertainty, knowing that we can control our growth is heartening. I'd encourage us to take just a moment and jot down some thoughts, whether it's on your note catcher or a post-it, but jot down some thoughts on possible habits you'd change in working towards your goals. I'll give you just a minute to do that. And then, Jennifer, if you have that link handy in just a minute, I'll explain what we're doing on this slide. And if you would drop that into the chat, I would be super grateful. 
in just a minute here. Okay, I'm going to drop a link into the chat and it's a one question Google form because I want to, I want to be able to see this and I can't see the chat. I'd like you to keep in mind that what you write on this could be personal, but know that it might, there might be some crossover between that personal and professional goal. So it doesn't matter what you write necessarily if it's personal or professional, but please respond to the question and Jen will drop that into the chat now if that's handy. Yep, I just dropped it in there. Perfect. What habit do you need to break or build in order to meet a personal or professional goal in your life? Oh, and I meant to have my phone so I could see my see that populate. I feel like I should sing or something while I use my wait time. What habit do you need to break or build in order to meet a personal or professional goal? And when you've had enough time, if you would just put a yes in the poll and then I'll finish up. Or a yes in the chat, sorry. Like we have quite a few folks who have already done that. Okay, perfect. Thanks everybody for being active participants today. Thank you, yes, thank you so much. I want to share this image one more time. You don't have to make huge, unmanageable, expensive changes that won't stick. You need to find small, manageable adjustments that most importantly make you feel confident or give your brain that win and apply them over time to change the trajectory of your learning. My belief is that we can change our personal and professional paths if we learn about habit science and then apply it in setting our goals and helping our students set goals. If you think about it, when we feel like we are in control of our learning, it builds our confidence as teachers and as human beings. And if we could pass that onto our students and help them grow into confident learners and humans, we've given a pretty impactful and lasting gift to the world. Thank you so much. Teresa, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing that with us. And like I said at the beginning, I think that was right on point with where we need to be today. So thank you for, uh, for taking the time to put together that and, and inspire each of us. So here's the deal. We have 27 minutes um, left on the schedule for this morning. So we had scheduled for this session to run until 1130. So first of all, if you have any questions or comments about the, the content that was just um, presented, we're more than willing to hang out and uh, address questions or have a conversation about any of those items. But the other thing is that at the, at the beginning of the day, you know, I asked you to, to keep your note catcher handy, which if you don't know where that is, that's in the helpful documents folder in the Schoology course. So if you haven't pulled that down yet, that's where you would go to find it. But you have some time here this morning where maybe you still have a babysitter lined up for the kids or your husband is still out at a long breakfast or something. Um, so I would encourage you to take advantage of that time and spend some time in reflection on what you've learned 
and look at what habits you might like to adjust or change or build into your life, ways that you might want to set a goal for yourself. And that, that is not, that's not a have to do item from me, but it's a strongly encouraged to do item for me. I can tell you that in my own life, I am a pretty good uh, goal setter. I'm a very goal driven person, maybe too much so. Uh, but that is something yeah. that certainly I've seen in my own professional and personal growth. And, uh, so I would strongly encourage you to just spend some time in reflection and, and think about what you might want to do. Uh, feel free to add to that note catcher if you'd like, uh, the, the next live session that you have today, your last live session will be the session with your principal that's scheduled at two o'clock mountain time, one o'clock Pacific time. So you should have received an invitation from your principal on how to access that. Most of them are using Zoom or using Meet. So you should have an email about that. And if you, if you haven't received that yet, feel free to reach out to us and, and we'll, um, we, can, we can help you get coordinated there and get connected with your principal. But that's what yeah. I would encourage you to do. Did you want to add to that, Teresa? Um, I was just catching up on the chats and uh, literally hundreds. I can't, I can't go back that far. So did somebody have a question because Jen messaged me, Jennifer, did you have? Um, All right. There are a couple follow-up questions. Okay. Um, however, we can get the log and, um, if she can't answer them today, then she'll follow up with you, um, via email. Um, there I would love to there. answer them. I would love to answer them, but honestly, there are hundreds and I, yeah. I, I couldn't monitor that. So um, I guess they could re-ask them, but I'm still scrolling, so. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there are um, individualized uh, questions, okay. um, like explaining what this looks like um, when you teach it to your, your students. Um, but I can work with you on making sure that you get those questions and um, Teresa can follow up after our session today. Perfect. And I did address that in the, I can't remember my session, Habits Before Goals, the breakout session. And I, I start out with a slide presentation and that is, I do share that with the people in that breakout session, but I, I teach the students it, explicitly about here is what it takes to be a successful online learner and these are the habits that you need to develop and then I ask them to set goals and we identify those habits that they think will be the most needed but yes follow up with me via email or uh, in the in the um, breakout session happy to answer those and the reason I turned off my video is that when I start, if I, in order to be clear and articulate or, and articulate my words, I have to talk over my braces and then it looks a lot like a horse eating oats. And so I didn't want to put you through that this morning. Not that I didn't want to make eye contact. I just didn't want to look silly. Thank you so much for your questions. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thanks again, Teresa. So everybody enjoy the rest of your day. If you haven't uh, gone through the rest of your breakouts or any of the um, you know, department content, now's a good time to do that as well. And then uh, once again, last live session for the conference, we'll be with your principal at two o'clock. Thanks everybody. I hope everybody has a great rest of your day and a great weekend. Thanks for being with us the last couple of days. Bye everybody.